I cannot do a video about ski differences between Europe and the US without talking about Hey guys, what's up? It's Kelly again and welcome back to my channel. For today's video, I'm going to talk to you guys about ski culture differences between North America and Europe. Now up front, I want to say that I did not grow up skiing. In fact, the first time I actually learned to snowboard was when I was 27 years old in Turkey, of all places, with some friends. I immediately fell in love with it, despite how incredibly bruised my butt was, and have since snowboarded in Austria and Canada. Washington State, Colorado, Oregon, Idaho. I've done a lot of snowboarding in the past five years. And then this past Christmas, I decided that I wanted to learn how to ski in Chamonix, France by watching YouTube videos because I'm just too cheap to pay for lessons. So I say all of this to make the point that I am very much an outsider coming into this culture and I have noticed some very interesting and stark differences between skiing and boarding in Europe versus North America. First up, holy cow is it more expensive to ski in the United States and North America than it is in Europe. About a month ago I went to Breckenridge, Colorado and for a one day ski pass it was $200 dollars. I could not believe what I was seeing on the sign listing out the prices. In contrast, when I was in Chamonix this past Christmas, for one day of skiing it was only about $60. That's a $140 price difference. I haven't been to Whistler Blackcomb in Canada for a couple of years now, but when I sat down to make this video I got curious about how much it would cost for a one day ski pass there, and I found that it was a hundred and eighty dollars compared to Alpendorf, Austria, which is where I would go when I was snowboarding in Austria. It's very close to Salzburg, where their price was listed at about sixty dollars. Now, if you start factoring in lodging and food expenses, you'll start to see some discrepancies depending on when you book and where you book and where you're eating, how much, and so on. But in my personal experience, I found that food and lodging are roughly about the same between Europe and North America. I've also never have done ski school because I'm too cheap and I don't have children, so I'm not really familiar with ski school prices but it's my understanding that ski school is also cheaper in Europe than it is in North America. In fact, a few years ago when I was boarding in Austria, I was talking to a guy who had his whole family with him for a week-long ski vacation, and he told me that it was cheaper for him to fly his family from Colorado, which is one of the world-renowned places to ski and snowboard in the U.S., so from Colorado all the way to Austria and to put his two children in ski school and buy lift passes for every day for he and his wife than it was for him to just drive the two hours to Breckenridge, Vail, and all of the other ski resorts that are in Colorado in the Rocky Mountains because of the ski lift and ski school price differences. That's crazy. The second big difference that I noticed just with a quick cursory look at the mountain is that there seems to be far more snowboarders in North America than in Europe. Now I have no idea why snowboarding is more popular in North America than it seems to be in Europe, although I will say it seems like Europe is starting to embrace snowboarding more and more. Um, but that's just the way it is. I mean, I could get into different stereotypes of skiers versus snowboarders and try to match them up with Europe and uh, North American culture, but I still don't think that would really get into the root of why there's this stark contrast. Another big difference is the lift line protocol. In Europe, it is a bit chaotic. It feels like everyone is just cramming themselves into the lines. They're running their skis over top of each other. You're lucky if you're able to keep with your group or even just your one skiing partner because of how everybody is just shoving their ways to the lift chair. Whereas in North America, it is much more organized and managed. 
For example, at most lifts, especially the busier ones, the bigger ones that are at the bottom of the hill, there will be these entire roped off lanes that separate singles from doubles, from groups of three, and so on. And then you move forward as such, and then when you get to the point where you need to merge to get onto the ski lift, you alternate and you group together to make four or six or however many the ski lift seats. And at more crowded chairs, it's common to even have someone that works for the resort standing there helping to manage this process by pairing up these different lines to get onto the ski lift. And to me, it is much more relaxing because it's not this chaotic free-for-all like it is in Europe. But even with this difference in lift lines where it seems like Europeans are just rushing to get onto the lift chair, I would actually say that in North America it feels like people are much more aggressive about getting as many runs in as possible during their ski day. They're already in line when the lifts start running. They're hesitant to take breaks. They might not even stop for lunch and they'll often gravitate to whatever lifts have the shorter lines. Even if it's not a great run that they love doing, they'll still go to that lift just because they don't want to have to wait in line and they want to get in as many runs as possible. In fact, there's even an app that works at a lot of different resorts in Colorado and some other places that tracks how many runs you've done and how many miles or feet or meters you have skied or snowboarded throughout the day, which I think just kind of speaks to this idea that Americans are often trying to get in as much as they can. I didn't get this same impression when I was boarding in Europe. It seemed like it was much more laissez-faire, people were taking their time to get to the lift in the morning, and once they got to the top they would take their time to get ready, get all their stuff on, they would take numerous breaks for hot cocoa or schnapps and so on. They would have a nice leisurely lunch. Now, maybe this is because lift tickets are over twice as expensive in North America as they are in Europe, and so maybe Americans are a bit encouraged to try to get as much as they can out of their money. Um, or maybe it is just another example of this classic American culture of having a much quicker pace where we get our coffees to go, where we have a very quick lunch before we run back to work compared to our European counterparts who I feel like take life at a bit of a slower pace pace. They stop to have their coffee at a cafe, they aren't hesitant to relax and enjoy the scenery and the company they're sharing their time with. I actually had a really hard time adjusting to this slower pace when I was boarding and skiing in Europe with my friends because I am someone that wants to go, go, go and get in as many runs as I can. And so taking a lot of breaks just isn't my jam. Speaking of schnapps though, this seemed to be a huge thing in Austria and I imagine it is also in parts of Germany and Switzerland, but it is not a thing in the West. So schnapps of course is liquor that's been flavored oftentimes with fruit and herbs and spices and it is usually taken as one shot. I've seen schnapps take on many different forms and whenever I was boarding in Austria it was common for the group I was boarding with to want to stop and share a round or two of schnapps throughout the day. In the US, schnapps in general just aren't really popular and it's not a part of our culture, so I'm sure it's unsurprising when I say that people aren't stopping to take schnapps breaks. In fact, I don't even think you can buy schnapps at the different resorts that I've been in uh, in North America, but also not even shots. People aren't stopping to take quick drinks of alcohol. Although I will say that I have seen Americans bring a flask with them for their ski day and have a quick nip whenever they're on the lift going to their next run. Because again, getting in more runs is favored over taking breaks. 
Another contributing factor to this difference could be that in the US, the mountain is set up quite a bit different compared to Europe, in that one corporation owns the lift and all of the restaurants. And those restaurants are typically located at either the top or the bottom of the mountain. Now that doesn't mean all of the restaurants offer the exact same food. In fact, there's usually quite a variety from sushi and ramen to barbecue ribs and burgers. They'll even serve beer that's mainstream and mass produced like Coors Light and then they'll serve craft beers from the local or regional microbreweries. But these restaurants sort of give you the feeling that your cattle being quickly herded through. Whereas in Europe, there are huts everywhere, dotting the mountains at the top, at the bottom, and everywhere in between. And each of these huts are owned independently, and so they all have a bit of a different feeling to them. The huts often have their own menus and specialties, and then in addition to beer and wine, they may also have schnapps. I guess I should add here that it's obvious, but of course the drinking age in Europe is much lower than it is in the US, and so it was common for me to see what looked like young teenagers drinking in Europe, whereas in the US there are of course signs everywhere saying that you have to be 21 or older to be able to drink, and then the waitress or the bartender will be checking your ID if you order alcohol. Speaking of signs, there are of course on the runs different yellow signs in both Europe and the US telling you to slow down in certain zones or letting you know that trails are about to merge. But it felt like in the US there were so many more signs, like to the point where it just felt egregious. And I don't know if it's because Americans just have a hard time following the rules or if it's because of the fear of lawsuits, but whatever it is, it is a very noticeable difference. Also, as an example of how Americans don't like to follow rules, I have noticed that in the US, people may or may not lower the restraint bar. In fact, I have been on many, many chairlifts where nobody has cared to lower the bar at all, and on the chairlifts where people do want to lower the bar, they will actually ask, do you mind if I lower the restraint bar as though they're doing everyone on the chair some sort of inconvenience, and then they will slowly lower the the restraint bar. This is not the case in Europe. In Europe, when you get on the lift, it seems like there is this mad rush to lower the restraint bar as soon as humanly possible. I cannot tell you how many times I have been hit on the head, thankfully with a helmet on, by the restraint bar because I have barely sat down before someone on the chair is already aggressively yanking the bar in front of us. Like, I get that it's a safety precaution, but good lord. Another big difference between Europe and the US is the color coding of the runs. So in the US, green means easy, blue means intermediate, a single black diamond means expert, and a double black diamond means extremely difficult. Whereas in Europe, green means very easy, like learner's easy with a very low grade. And then blue is the next level up of easy, and then red is intermediate, black is for expert, and orange is for extremely difficult. I actually have never seen an orange, not that I'm seeking it out because... I cannot do that. I've also noticed that terrain parks are far more popular in the US compared to Europe. Even in the smaller resorts, chances are there will be some sort of terrain park. I will also add that it felt like the runs themselves were much more groomed in Europe compared to in the US and Canada. And also the scenery and the landscape in Europe was much more spectacular than in North America, with the exception of Whistler black home that's very beautiful and then in Washington State if you can get a clear shot of Mount Rainier that's breathtaking but in general I felt like Europe's views of the Alps was much more spectacular. 
Okay, so that's all I have for the culture differences on the mountain, but that's not where the differences end. So after a day of skiing or snowboarding, Americans tend to retreat to their rentals and hop into the hot tub or hot springs to soothe their sore muscles. In fact, it is a major selling point for the different lodging options available near a ski resort if they have a hot tub. So you'll always see that be advertised. Whereas in Europe, saunas are the popular thing to go to. In fact, I don't think I ever saw a hot tub when I was in Europe. And conversely, I only ever saw one sauna the whole time that I've been boarding in the US, and that was at some random Airbnb I stayed at in Oregon near Mount Hood. And if you watched my video on sauna culture in Germany, then you know that I hate saunas because I do not like being trapped in suffocating heat. So I much prefer hot tubs because if you get too hot, you can just sit outside of the hot tub or even keep your feet still in and continue to enjoy the time with your friends. Whereas with the sauna, you're either in it or you're not. And lastly, I cannot do a video about ski differences between Europe and the US without talking about après ski. Après ski essentially means after ski party and it takes on many different forms, but the essential elements are loud music, alcohol, and fun with dancing. Now traditionally, I've seen people go straight to après ski right when they get off the mountain and all they've done is take off their skis and their snowboards so they're still wearing their boots and their snowsuits, but I've also seen it where people go back to their rentals and shower and change and then go après ski. But either way, I would venture to say that après ski is taken much more seriously in Europe than it is in the US, which makes sense given that après ski originated in Europe. All right guys, that's all I've got for you today. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I'm interested to hear if I missed anything that you've noticed skiing or boarding in both Europe and North America, or if you prefer to ski or board in Europe versus North America, what your favorite ski resorts are. Don't forget to leave those comments below. I love to read them. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a big thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much to all of my patrons for the support you've given me, and I will see you guys next time. Bye!